Hello, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, who's responsible for suicides that result from cyberbullying? Our digital producer Omar Badai is filling in for Malika Bilal this week. We have an online community that so I'm really intrigued by what they're saying about cyberbullying, Omar. They're saying, you know, they have a lot of different opinions about where responsibility ultimately lies, you know, whether it's parents or schools or law enforcement or even the social networks themselves. Of course, we're going to get to their input a little bit later, but in the meantime, for those of you watching at home, be sure to tweet us using the hashtag you see on your screen right now, AJStream. Sitting on the set with Omar and myself is Nancy Willard, and Nancy is the director of Embrace Civility. That's an organization that helps to keep young people safe online. Nancy, it's good to have you with us. Thank you very much. You'll hear more from Nancy in just a little bit. Now, cyberbullying isn't the only story we're following on the stream. Here are some of the other hashtags our community is watching. From North America to Europe to East Asia, there are cases of young people who have been bullied online and then committed suicide. People like Amanda Todd, Tyler Clementi, Sierra Pugsley, and Carolina Picchio. And parents and schools in these cases are struggling to know what to do about it. I just got an absolute horrible feeling. I don't know how else to describe it. I opened her door and I found her hanging in her closet. Um, Cyberbullying seemed to emerge very quickly. Neither the public, nor the parents, nor the education system, or the legal system was really prepared to respond. In Italy, Caroline Piccio's parents are blaming Facebook for their daughter's suicide. The 14-year-old killed herself after pictures and video of her at a party were passed around online, even though she told Facebook about the problem. They didn't respond. And now the Italian authorities are investigating whether staff members at Facebook can be charged in connection with her death. So, is Facebook and other social networking sites responsible when cyberbullying turns deadly? To help us in this conversation, joining us in Washington, D.C., is Stephen Borkham. Stephen is the CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute. On Skype, all the way from Kent in the UK, we have Georgia Woods. And Georgia survived cyberbullying and is now a student ambassador with the Beat Bullying Charity. And also on Skype from West Virginia in the US, we have Aidan McDaniel, an anti-bullying advocate. It's good to have all of you in the stream today. Georgia, I'm going to start with you. Take us back about five years when you were in the middle of being cyberbullied. What happened? I just started secondary school, which is from the age of 11 up to 18 and I had fallen out with a group of girls because I perform a lot so I'd spend a lot of time on my own dancing, singing and they didn't like that very much so they would call me names, they would exclude me from certain activities and it kind of didn't seem like a lot at first but when more and more people start to do it, it, it hit me quite hard and then most of the year stopped talking to me altogether. I'd get sharpened Coke cans thrown at me. I'd get sharpened rocks thrown at me. I'd have social networking sites set up as hate mail pages for me and it all just got too much and that went on for about six to nine months. And then I decided that I couldn't take it anymore and I attempted suicide. Georgia, but you look perfectly lovely to me. How can your entire year gang up on you like this? How do you explain I that? that every day and a lot of people tell me that it's jealousy but as me being myself I don't see how they can be jealous I just see it as a group of people who got bored and I was an easy target and when you said you committed suicide can you take us through that thought process because that is some of the that's the hardest thing for a lot of outsiders to understand why you would even go there I remember the day extremely well I was sat in my in last period I'd had a shocking day as it was, names called things thrown at me, being pushed around, feeling rubbish. And 
I couldn't shake the feeling of feeling alone. It just felt like every corner I turned, I'd be alone, but there'd be millions of people watching me. So I just thought, you know what, I can't do this anymore. So I went to the school toilets and I tried to hang myself. And fortunately, I wasn't, I didn't really think it through, didn't really know what to do and it didn't work. But it kind of gave me enough time to think about how the effects of suicide would have affected my family. I would have never seen my sister grow up. And that's really what stopped me because I had that, um, that time to think. And a lot of kids don't give that time to themselves. They just go straight ahead with it, which is the problem, I think. You know, you've just made all the Al Jazeera audience start crying right now, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to bring Omar uh, into the conversation. He's, he's talking to some of our online community. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what cyberbullying is and what the big deal about it is. If you take a look at my screen here, uh, Inkpile says uh, you can easily unfollow or unfriend a cyberbully. You can even get them suspended from networks like Twitter. Don't see why this is a big issue and why, since it's so easy to deal with. But we have a response here from Michael who says, I think cyberbullying is actually worse. It's faceless and seemingly infinite. With face to face, you can just walk away. But how do you escape cyberbullying? Um, I want to throw this to Aiden actually and say, can you explain to Inkpile what actually he's missing and why cyberbullying actually is a problem? Well, the thing, is, the thing about it is that the internet is a really big place. and it's really easy to get in touch with people. It's really easy to stay connected to people over the internet. That's kind of the idea behind it. So, and especially if you're feeling, if you're feeling harassed, if you're feeling intimidated, um, it feels like you can't get away from it. It feels like you can't escape it. Uh, especially if you're experiencing it both online and in real life, it, it just seems like you have nowhere, you have nowhere to turn. Um, and we all know firsthand that um, the internet is a good place and we all know firsthand that uh, so many people are on it and so many people have the ability to get in touch with you, people that you might not even know so though it would seem uh, on first, like for the first impression that uh, to get away from it all it would take would be to block or unfollow or whatever it is the other person it's not so because you can do that and that is a good step to take but in order to really in order to really solve the issue it takes a lot more it takes the support of your family and your friends and your school right and it takes dealing with the problem at the source which is the bully and everyone else around you it takes everybody working together towards the problem to solve it it doesn't okay. not just as easy as following someone okay nancy the issue that we have to think about is that this is this is occurring within the community. You you heard George's story. This wasn't just some anonymous young people online. This was tied in to the face-to-face -face relationships that are occurring at school. So we have to understand that the this is both face-to-face -face and digital, and we're not going to be able to address it without that community focus. It's just what Aiden said. We've, we've got to, the place where these young people are together is in school. So we've got to have school taking leadership. They can't just say, hey, off campus, not our job. It's affecting their children in school. So they've got to take responsibility for helping young people re address and resolve and pre prevent these situations from happening. Okay, so Georgia, I'm, I'm so glad somebody found you in the toilet at school and you're, you're here to tell that story and help other young people. If the worst case scenario had happened, would it have been anything that had happened online that would have been responsible, do you think? Like the case in Italy, where the parents are going to are saying that Facebook, it was Facebook that com that was responsible for their daughter's death. What do you think about that? I don't think any social networking site is to blame for the reason why a child is to commit suicide, because it isn't just that one thing. It's the building up of lots of things. It could have been weeks and weeks and weeks building up to that, and then the posting of the videos, and then Facebook not reacting to it could have just kind of could have just been enough for her. But I do think that Facebook have made it too easy for people to get banned and then to rejoin because anyone can make a new email account and then make a new Facebook account. So, what so many people can do that. I don't think they are harsh enough on their restrictions. 
So what would you um, suggest that Facebook do then, Georgia? See, that's the thing, there's not re with something like that, I don't think there's a lot you can do because you can't ban certain names because that's banning part of the world because everyone's going to have the same name. I just think there needs to be a quicker response and things like cyberbullying need to be seen as a serious issue and not just a few names being called over Facebook. You know, there's a disagreement online about whether social networks are actually responsible for this sort of thing. Uh, we have Patrick here saying social media sites have failed to acknowledge the fact that cyberbullying is on the rise and so they are to blame because they haven't done anything about it. And we have Muneev here saying, can science be held responsible for nuclear disasters? No. And so it goes with social networking sites as well. Uh, Steve, if I may throw this to you, um, do you think that social media networks have a responsibility to do more given the fact that cyberbullying is so common? Well, of course, and I th our belief is that we all have responsibilities, differing but over overlapping responsibilities. That's the social networking sites, that's parents, that's teachers, and the kids themselves uh, also play a role in all of this. And, and we've seen time and time again that um, with suicides and suicide attempts that involve cyberbullying, there is a whole range of other factors and other issues going to play here. But having said that, yes, Facebook can do better, and I believe they are doing better than they were, say, two or three years ago. I think that also we want to make sure that Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and all the whole universe of social media sites and apps are also stepping up to the plate here. So I'm just looking at what Facebook is saying about controversial, harmful and hateful speech on Facebook, and they're saying that we will increase the accountability of the creators of content that does not qualify as actionable hate speech but is cruel or insensitive by insisting that the authors stand behind the content they, they create. I actually don't understand what they just said there, Nancy. I can't, is it important? Okay. <laughs> yes. um, one of the keys with Facebook is when you establish a user account, they say that you need to have your name. Basically, if our name is going out there, that's our mm. reputation, and it's their perspective that you will then pay attention to your digital footprint because people don't like those who are being bullied. But on their pages, they were not requiring people to have their real names. And that's what they're focusing on now is increasing the, the accountability on those pages. Facebook has done a lot of, uh, has a lot of effort in responding to the abuse reports. We do need to ask them why what happened here? If there were multiple reports filed, why didn't that material get down? But Facebook is not the issue. If, if that material had gotten down on Facebook, this was, this was a hurtful situation that was occurring face to face and online. It was probably also occurring via cell phone. Um, it, it was multiple factors involved, multiple environments. So you can't blame any one particular environment or factor. You've worked with Aiden, and Aiden's pretty impressive. Aiden, tell us about the work that you do, because I think, what's the point of blaming anybody? How do we work out how to fix it? And that's what you actually do. Yeah, um, I'm a social activist in my community and in my schools. Um, and a lot of what we tell teachers and students and parents and everybody is that, uh, that we can't, this isn't an issue that we can solve on our own. So we as students can't solve it on our own, and adults can't solve it on their own. So one group of people can't fix this issue. And additionally, alongside that, it's not an issue that only affects, uh, that only affects children or students. Uh, the rate of um, workplace bullying and violence is so high in the United States that last year the U.S. Justice Department listed it as one of the greatest threats to uh, U.S. productivity. So the fact of the matter is, is that this is not a student problem and adult issue to fix. It's everybody's problem and everybody's issue to fix. Right, Aiden, and excuse me for asking you your age and being very personal, but how old are you? I'm 16. Okay, so that's really critical. So what can you do as a 16 year old to stop bullying? Um, one of the biggest parts, and I'm sure that um, everybody in the conversation can agree with this, is one, one of the biggest parts to solving bullying is to be there. Um, so if, if we spend so much energy and so much time trying to fight the bully, 
or uh, if we only focus on one, if only focus on one group, I don't believe we believe, then it's not going to work as well. What we need to do is we need to get all those people that are doing nothing, the bystanders, um, into the into the mix because they're the ones with the real power. The, the fact of the matter is, is that if a bully um, feels that their environment is not conducive to what they're trying to do, then they won't, or they'll be a lot less likely to. You know, it, it's a lot harder to keep doing what you're doing if you know it's negative, uh, first of all, and also if there's a lot of people telling you to stop. So what we try to encourage is uh, this idea, this notion that I, as a 16-year-old, right. can prevent bullying by, any time I see it or hear about it, being there, and standing up for uh, the other person, standing up for the person that's getting bullied and standing up to the person that's bullying. Okay. So, Aiden, let me just bring in the community because they're dying to jump in the conversation, as too is Nancy and Georgia. You haven't escaped either. We're coming back to you two. We have actually a video comment specifically about what pe young people can do. Uh, Kevin from Minnesota has a very interesting initiative. Take a listen. Hi, my name is Kevin Kerwick, and through the use of my Twitter page, Osseo Nice Things, I've really been able to show how positivity can really change the culture of a high school and combat bullying in a unique way. And now with over 500 accounts on Twitter similar to mine nationwide, it's, it's fair to say that this has become somewhat of a trend on social media. And so whether it's through Twitter, Facebook, or really just at school, the most important thing I've noticed when it comes to fighting bullying is to make kindness and positivity the popular thing to do. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to comment yeah, on this. I <laughs> want to. Bullying is socially motivated. And that means how the peers or how stu young people perceive the peers think about the one being hurtful is going to control how all of this happens. We know from data that the vast majority of young people really disapprove of this and they really, really look up to those who step in to help. So what we have to do is engage and empower young people as leaders. Too many of the bullying prevention programs that are in schools today are all adult-centric. Adults are making rules against bullying and they're su increasing supervision and they're telling bullies to tell adults. Well, adults aren't making rules in digital space. They're not present in these digital communities and young people frequently aren't telling them. Right, so Nancy. We let's have see. to get young people in leadership, just what? like you are with Aiden, Kevin, and Georgia. I was just saying, let's be more youth-centric then. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So stop talking, Nancy, so I can bring go back in it. Georgia. You go for the young people. Oh my goodness, you can tell that Nancy is not organizer. She was organizing this debate, but I'm wrenching it back so we can <laughs> go it. to Kent. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you for the permission, Nancy. <laughs> Georgia, tell me about being an ambassador for um, at Beat Bullying. I've got the, the Twitter site up here. It's got lots of great advice. It's almost like this resource. I know we're talking about maybe social media uh, sites um, promoting bullying, but what about anti-bullying? There's almost as many anti-bullying sites as bullying places, right? Oh, uh, I'd like to say that I'd agree, but Beat Bullying is actually, in the UK, it's the first type of anti-bullying site there is. So it's somewhere that kids can go if they don't want to talk to teachers because they might think they're being stupid or they don't want to talk to their parents because they feel like they might be giving them more stress than they need they can go there they can go online they can have online mentoring sessions and it's just and kids do it like i'm a mentor i've been a mentor for three years now so it's kids talking to kids so you can talk in text talk you can talk the way you want to and feel comfortable because you're talking to someone that's not above you is on the same wavelength as you and it's so easy to talk to just talk to them and you feel like you can tell them stuff because they won't judge you. Georgia tell me about a story that you or somebody that you mentored where it ended quite happily. Unfortunately I can't give details. I knew you were going to say 100% that. 100% confidential. <laughs> but, but give us I've an uh, give us a scenario so that we actually understand what you do. I'll have someone come to me who feels like they can't step out the front door without being criticised or without being told that they're a horrible person and they don't see any good in the world anymore which then reflects them and they've actually turned into a bad person if you'd like, they feel like they are and through 
listening and understanding and letting them know that what they're feeling isn't wrong but what's being done to them isn't right it kind of gives them that relief that they're not on their own that they don't have to be on their own and that they can talk to their parents about it and there's light at the end of the tunnel I mean a lot of kids who have read my story who have heard my story will come to me because I am I'm proof that there's light at the end of a tunnel all bullying scenarios don't have to end in suicide and I think that's something that people need to learn right that just because someone's being bullied it doesn't mean it has to end badly that's a great place to end this part of the show and we're going to continue talking at stream.aljazeera.com and we'll talk about more scenarios about cyberbullying and how to combat that. So stream.aljazeera.com is where you need to switch over to if you're not watching there already. But right now, here's Omar with some of the other stories we're following. Alicia Keys is catching some heat after announcing her plans to perform in Israel this summer, with more than 13,000 netizens signing a petition asking her to cancel her show. The petition got a bump after a US-based student group created this video using her song, Girl on Fire, to highlight Palestinian women who are non-violently resisting the Israeli occupation. A poll on BET, or Black Entertainment Television, showed that 63% of respondents said that Keys should not perform. Our next lead is from Brazil, where bus fare hikes have, have commuters up in arms. Take a look. Independent newspaper, Anova Democracia, uploaded this footage of last week's protest in Rio. Protesters can be heard shouting, the public united will never be defeated. Since then, countrywide demonstrations with thousands of protesters have escalated into police clashes. The Movimento Passe Livre, or Free Pass Movement, has been mobilizing youth protesters to action on Facebook. Their message is clear. If, if the fair does not go down, the city will stop. The latest call to action in Sao Paulo drew 12,000 protesters, with many holding signs like this one saying, the people shouldn't fear the government, it is the government that should fear the people. Of course, we'll continue following these stories on stream.aljazeera.com, uh, where you can check out more of our coverage. And in the meantime, let us know what stories have caught your eye because they could end up on a future show. Femi? Let me just bring in Nancy. We're just talking about news stories that, that are making news online. And when you look at cyberbullying stories online, I know there's something that really annoys you about how the media covers them. Just as, we, as a leading thought, because I think it's quite important, okay. right? We, we have to recognize that a decision by a young person to suicide might be triggered by a cyberbullying incident, but it's never the exclusive cause. There are always a number of factors that build up. And what's really important for us to do is stop this messaging that cyberbullying is causing suicide okay. because that creates the script that then when a young person is being cyberbullied, they may consider that suicide is the option. Right. So I really like George's approach. Hey, you know, there are lots of things you can do. This, this you know, reach out, find a friend, and, and being a friend Nancy, to somebody Nancy, we just did a PSA. Helping. I think we kind of addressed it beautifully, right? Great. Just yes, in time for stream.outazero.com. That will be on the post show. But what about on Monday's program? We head to Bosnia to look at what's become known as the Baby Revolution. It has generated some of the largest demonstrations in the past decade. If this story is new to you, it won't be on the next Al Jazeera stream. I will see you there online. Hello, it's good to see you again. This is the Streams Online Post Show, 
and today we're talking about cyberbullying. So let's get right back to the discussion. Parents, they're kind of important, right, Omar? In yeah, this absolutely. discussion, what, yeah. what do you have from the online community? What are they say? Yeah, crucial role, and we have actually people who have different views on this as well. You have Safia here who says parents need to be need to be more aware of their child's internet usage. Uh, on the other hand, we have this comment from Mirza who says. The protector generation has less of an understanding of this medium than does the generation that needs the protection. If we see someone get stabbed, we know how to react because we've grown up around the situation and we know we have precedent for it. While e-behavior is something that parents have no precedent for and therefore is not something they can react to. Uh, Steve, do you have any comments? Do you have any thoughts on whether there is a generational issue here that makes parents unable to deal with, cy with cyberbullying? I, I think we're in the middle of a historical generational shift. I mean, I'm a parent who the internet happened to me halfway through my life. Um, and we've been playing catch up with our kids ever since. You know, we set up something called a platformforgood.org precisely to reach parents as well as teachers and teens. And for, for parents, we have something called Teach Parents Tech. And it's two teenagers talking straight to camera, explaining to their clueless parents about social media, reputation, uh, privacy settings, and so on. So we have a very big job to do to reach parents, particularly of this generation. Is there anything about laws and, le and being illegal in terms of cyberbullying? Is there any way forward that way, Stephen? You know, I am very... Uh, a little bit anxious about the rush to legislation. I mean, do we really, w I mean, I, there have been proposals to uh, legislate against bullying in the classroom or in, in the gym or in, in the school. I, I don't know if we really want to criminalize our kids' behavior. I'm not sure if using law enforcement is the right approach. I, I appreciate Nancy's approach and George's approach here around education, around social norms about making bullying a stupid and almost unacceptable thing like we've done with cigarettes, for instance. So we, we need to push people towards what's great online and make those kids the cool ones uh, rather than being afraid of the bullies. Stephen, have a listen to this. Georgia? Pardon? You, you, you don't agree with what Stephen just said. Why not? If something is criminalized, I think that it's seen as uncool. So the popular kids aren't wanna, gonna wanna do something that isn't seen as cool anymore. I just think that if, some, if there was a, a punishment that was put in place for extreme cases of bullying, not just a little bit of name calling in the playground, in extreme cases, then it may lower the percentage of, of, uh, of kids that are being bullied because the truth of the matter is that we're never ever going to be able to stop bullying altogether because we can't control speech. Everyone has the right to freedom of speech. That can never be changed. So we can never c control what someone says, but we can always deter them from saying the wrong thing. Aidan, I see you nodding. What's your take on making cyberbullying illegal? Well, I, I agree with Georgia about the whole um, freedom of speech thing because she's, she's completely right. I mean, we, we can never this is an issue that we will never 100% stick. And exactly for the reason that she said, because people are people and we can't control what they say. But I do think that um, criminalizing bullying is a slippery slope uh, because I think that, and I think that part of the reason why there's been a jump to, uh, to that decision has been um, kind of going back to the conversation about you know, bullying equaling suicide which it does not. Um, that's something that I think we really need to, to educate uh, everyone on, is that though the media is kind of trying to perpetuate this idea of bully side, it's, it's not so. People commit suicide or attempt suicide because of a lot of different factors, uh, of a myriad of different issues that's going on in their lives. Is bullying a factor that affects that? Absolutely, yes. Does it make it harder? Yes, absolutely. But solely being bullied does not 100% guarantee that person going to commit suicide or attempting to commit suicide. Okay. So I think that in order to, in order to make that um, more clear, okay. that would help people to understand what they are criminalizing. Georgia, you were just saying something. Go ahead. Uh, I think that the reason why bullying is being seen, uh, like suicide, sorry, is being seen as a link to cyberbullying 
is because it's taken so many children, because we are children, to take their lives for cyberbullying to be seen as a serious issue. Nancy? I think that we are more focused in on bullying. I've seen a really significant increase of attention to bullying because the internet has made what was invisible before more visible. So because, I mean, if you're in a nasty altercation on the school grounds, that's not recorded and others can't jump in. But if it goes on the internet, it goes online, then it's recorded. So the digital evidence falls two ways. So in fact, the research indicates that in the United States, rates of bullying are decreasing and rates of youth suicide are not increasing. So, so it's wrong to be continuing to make that connection. On the legal issue, um, ask the young people. It's also illegal for minors to drink and it's illegal for them to smoke pot. Um, are those two laws stopping that kind of behavior? Virtually in every state, there are statutes against egregious speech that have been modified to apply to um, cyberbullying here in the United States. So, so that's pretty much occurring. What we've got to do is get more comprehensive approaches in schools that focus on social emotional learning and on strategies for young people to step in and help. I, I was talking to you about that little important fact that you wanted to get out just before the end of the main show which was like a public service announcement because there's something that you really cared about there were lots of these public service announcements online and lots of campaigns online i want to play one of them and then ask you georgia and you aiden how effective you think it might be so this is a cyber bullying public service announcement have a listen to this no you're yeah. slut <laughs> Matthew G said you sent him naked pictures of yourself. No one would ever really date you. You're the most desperate girl in the entire school. So that's your mom. <laughs> <laughs> How's the depression thing working out? Sarah's mother told my mother that you had a breakdown. Oh. You're ugly. I wish you were dead. If you wouldn't say it, why would you type it? So Nancy is shaking her head. You heard horrible. that, Georgia. <laughs> horrible. Why are you saying it? Why are you saying it's horrible, horrible. Nancy? Because all that is is showing young people as negative, and it's not showing the solutions. What I want to see are the solutions. If something like that's occurring, I want to see a model of how do you step in and help? How do you say stop? We don't need to focus on the negative. We need to empower young people to engage in the positive. I think that's horrible. Georgia? Sometimes, though, you need to realize the negative so that you can see through to the positive. And in terms of, I mean, I'm just thinking about kids that I went to school with. We were really mean to each other, and we didn't even have mobile phones. And the fact that we would have mobile phones, we could do so much damage, perhaps even just teaching people that, some civility, which is what you do, Nancy. Is that helpful? I think that's helpful. Uh, the, I think when going back to the parent issue, the most important thing that parents can do is focus on the golden rule, mm -hmm. teaching people, teaching their children to always think about how they would want to be treated and use that as a guide for, um, for treating others. But also think about and really focus on the value of stepping in to help others. Aiden, where should people go if they're watching this and they're being bullied? What should they do about it? Well, I think that um, it's really important for schools and teachers and parents and students and everybody uh, to be educated as to how they can help each other because that's one of the biggest part of it, parts of it is that anybody who has been bullied or harassed or intimidated or whatever uh, one of the main themes of what they say is they wish that they had had with someone to be there for them because they felt isolated and they felt alone. And that, that in and of itself, having right. someone there for you can make the difference between a life and a death. 
And but in, on the subject of the public servants, public service announcement, there was one part of it that I that I liked, which was that if you wouldn't speak it, don't type it. Right. And that raises an interesting issue: is that in what kind of what the internet does and what computers do is they give this false sense of anonymity. So we think that since we can't see each other, uh, that makes it that makes it different somehow. Sure. And so Aiden, we're out of time now. So I really want if somebody's sitting at home and she's like Georgia <laughs> five years ago, I really want you to help them out. That's what you do. Yes. Go on. Where should they go? Um, they should go to their friends. They okay. should go to their parents. They should go to their teachers. And they should find people like Georgia. And they should find uh, people like me, people that, people that do this. And they should know that they shouldn't be afraid to ask for help. Because That's there are a great a lot way of to end. In the world that care about them. That's a great way to end. And when you go on to stream.audazio.com, you will find the Twitter handles of every single one of our guests, including Nancy Willard, the director of Embrace Civility, Stephen Balkum. Stephen is from the Family Online Safety Institute, Georgia Woods, she's a beat bullying charity ambassador, and Aidan McDaniel, you've just been listening to him, he's an anti bullying advocate. So all of them will be online. You'll see their Twitter handles. I know they'll be very happy to engage with you. On the next. AJ Stream. We head to Bosnia to look at what's become known as the Baby Revolution. It has generated some of the largest demonstrations in the past decade. It's going to be an interesting conversation. I always say that, and it always is. See you online. Take care.